People parent differently. They don't parent exactly the same and sometimes parent different, very differently. And um, sometimes that's a point of contention and it becomes a conflict. It shouldn't become a conflict. Parenting differently and having different views of parenting can often be just the result of personality. Somebody who's more passive might have a passive style of parenting. Somebody who's more assertive might be have a more assertive type of parenting. The point there is not that both parent in the same way or even do the same thing, but they support each other in the way the other person parents instead of criticizing the other person because it doesn't look like what I think parenting should look like. I think that's fundamentally very important. I must tell you that was a, in my own personal relationship, my own, my own personal marriage, I think that was a awakening that um, I'm going to see somebody parent in an entirely different way than I parent or in the way I believe I should parent because of my own injuries or because of my own dreams or because of my own fears. There's somebody else in this relationship who's parenting because of their dreams and because of their fears and they're going to be entirely different than mine and our children are going to be okay. Kids are resilient. They can deal with two parenting styles. It's going to be hard to raise children with absolutely different values, at least, but not with different styles, not personality styles. Couples which have different goals can sometimes be very difficult to raise children if there's different goals because children are not know where to go. But having- so At that point, it becomes almost a different value in terms of what's important and they're trying to push things in different directions. And I use the term goals because it's it, the direction in which you're taking the ship, the direction which you're taking this marriage. But people have different values about parenting, which don't necessarily interfere with people's goals. We think right. they do, but they don't. And so you, you mentioned there, as long as there is no criticism. Yes. How important, or is it important? And if yes, how important is it to avoid criticism in front of children between parents. I uh, there's nothing wrong with parents uh, arguing with each other. In other words, disagreeing with each other, because as we've spoken before, agreeing to disagree is a healthy part of life. We can disagree with other people. I can disagree with somebody vehemently about an issue, but we still care about each other. We still respect. We're having a nice our discussion about something. I may be liberal, they may be conservative, and we're having a discussion. Children watch this and they learn, wow, people can, dis can agree to disagree. It's wonderful. Families arguing about stuff at the dinner table, they're loud, they're disagreeing, maybe sometimes getting a little inappropriate. But what they're seeing is that there's an R of respect going on with this. Criticism is something else. Criticism is not disagreeing. Criticism is putting somebody down and making somebody feel that they're not good enough because of something they're doing. And that's hurtful. That's not arguing. That's not having a different position. That's breaking somebody down. My experience is that children are more affected by watching their parents criticize each other and hurt each other than they are by being hurt themselves. Because when a child is hurt by himself, he goes to his room and cries. And by the way, I do not agree with violence at all, with hurting a child ever. But I often hear parents saying this, I cannot tolerate my spouse doing this to my child, hurting my child or hurting them emotionally. And I'm going to stop them from doing it. And so I am going to criticize them or I'm going to get in the middle of this so that they shouldn't do it. Now, in certain extreme situations, that makes sense. But in most situations, it is more hurtful for the child to create that criticism, to create that conflict between the two parents than the concern you have that your child might be affected by the fact that one of the parents may have been reacting to the child in a way which you didn't like, which you didn't think was fair, or which was hurtful. They are more hurt by watching their parents' marriage, what they are seeing is their parents' marriage becoming fragile or becoming uh, b blowing up and they're worried about, are my parents gonna get divorced? Than they are about their own pain. Right, but so really ultimately, children aside, criticism 
in a negative way, let's say destructive criticism as opposed to constructive feedback or constructive yeah. criticism, is something that is always, by the sound of things in any relationship, something that should be avoided. I don't know, maybe at all costs is pushing it, but very strongly. Always. If you want to criticize, if you have something that you don't understand, ask a question. And, and disagreement is fine as long as the disagreement is done in a way that's respectful rather than putting the person down. Another person feeling put down. Unfortunately, sometimes you cannot necessarily see that on your own. I don't know always that I can tell that what I'm doing is a criticism versus just asking a question. But I think we need to be sensitive to those things. When you're in a relationship long enough and somebody says to you, this really hurts me, you back away. Doesn't matter whether you feel like you didn't try to hurt that person or not. Doesn't matter. If that person feels hurt, back away. Apologize. Say, I'm sorry, because it hurts. You're in a marriage for 10, 15 years, or even two years. And the person says, yeah, this is really hurting me. Respect that. The fact that you didn't intend it has really nothing to do with it. But I think that's also important for both people to recognize that. That if you got hurt, doesn't mean that that person meant to hurt you. And that's a big piece about, about respect. Recognizing somebody can say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you, and back off. The guy apolo person apologizes, and, and, and as they make the, an effort not to do that again, or make an effort to show that they've uh, taken influence about that thing, then you can recognize that this person is serious. Okay. So I want to go maybe a, a, li a little more specific um, let's say someone's, you know, married again, however long it is, it's six months, it's three years, and they encounter something maybe that they really didn't expect, something unexpected, something that shocks them. It may be somewhat minor, it may be a very big skeleton in the closet of this person that they've committed to sharing the rest of their life with that they had no idea about and didn't see coming. What does a person do when, when that, something like that shows up? I think that's a question of what is a person ready to do. I don't know that there's one answer for that. I think uh, people find out things in a relationship which are very hurtful later on, or hurtful, or something they didn't expect, they didn't realize, they thought was important for them to know. Maybe the other partner didn't intentionally didn't tell them, or maybe the other partner didn't realize that they needed to tell them, and they just find it out. Um, it's a question of what they can tolerate. I think um, the question is what happens. That's what a big part of what forgiveness is about. Can I forgive this person? Can I overlook it? Um, is the person willing to, I think it goes both ways. One person has to forgive and the other person has to recognize how much that was hurtful and be able to uh, uh, make amends in some way or uh, show up in some way. Now, how would that work in practicality? That's a good question. But I, I think it's similar to what we said before. Uh, if the person said, you know, well, you never told me that. The person said, I didn't know that that was something I needed to tell you. Well, now you know that that's something that's very sensitive to them. Are you capable of now showing that you're going to be more open about those things in the future? So does, would, would you say that perhaps really what it boils down to is maybe like an evaluation of okay, so this is what this person means to me. Here is something that come, that's come up. Now I need to ask myself, which one holds more weight, right? right. Is, is my appreciation for this person, my commitment to this person strong enough that I can be prepared to overlook or to accept or to work through this? I think people who are in a traditional marriage, and I'm speaking here more as a rabbi than anything else, that's what we call a marriage, a commitment. We call marriage a bridge, a covenant between two people because sometimes really hurtful things happen in a relationship and um, the, it is the covenant of marriage which holds it together until they can overcome that difficulty. Um, if the, one partner is not willing to do their part of the work to overcome the difficulty, that's a sign this is an unhealthy relationship. That kind of relationship doesn't need to continue. When somebody continues to violate a relationship or violate the um, trust of somebody else, 
That's the, that means it's an unhealthy relationship. There has to be the sense that the person recognizes that there's pain over here and they're willing to do something about it. Whether it's their fault or it's not their fault, it doesn't matter. Just it matters is, is this really hurting somebody else? And if it's really hurting somebody else, how am I going to adjust to that? Today, I may be the stronger one and I'm more capable to forgive and to let go and to tend to somebody else's hurt. And hopefully tomorrow it'll be the other way around. And practically in relationships, um, very interesting fact I once heard about relationships is when you ask couples, happily married couples, who is sacrificing more for the relationship? I don't remember where I saw this, but who is sacrificing more for the relationship? You or the other person? And so the assumption is that in happy couples, people would say, the other person is sacrificing more, but it's not true. In happy couples, people say, I am sacrificing more, but it's worth it. Because they are going into the relationship with the notion that I am willing to give for this relationship. So it comes back to what we said much earlier, that when the connect connection is sufficiently robust, strong, developed, there doesn't need to be a denial of imperfections, etc., because That's we can right. be comfortable with them. They could be comfortable with them, and so people say, "No, I'll, of course." In in many relationships, people will recognize that the other person is giving more. Be thankful, but just because one person says, "I'm giving more in this relationship," what they're really saying is, "I notice I'm giving more in this relationship. I don't see when the other person is giving all the time," which is probably natural to a degree. Yes, I think it's natural. I think it's that's why the person is really willing to give that much because deep inside they're seeing the other person is giving something back just as much. So at a lower scale, let's say, you know, things come up and this is inevitable, right? In any long term relationship, any relationship that goes for more than 15 minutes, something is going to come up that's frustrating. Something is going to come up that's disappointing. And let's say we're not talking at the scale of things that really need to be evaluated. Do they, you know, do they outweigh the strength of the bond, et cetera, but just simple, basic things. Are there techniques, skills that people can work on, specific ways that people or things that people can keep in mind to? to get through, to manage that frustration, disappointment in a way that's perhaps the most healthy and going to have the least, um, introduce the least bumps into the road? That's a good question. A couple of things I have noticed when I work with couples, which is very important. Number one, forgive, uh, apologizing is a very important human skill the ability to apologize or the ability to say you're sorry is very important. When you say you're sorry, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're culpable. It's not like, forgive me, I did something terrible. Forgive me, I did something terrible is a culpability. It is my fault. I am responsible for this mess up. And that's why you shifted from apologize to sorry, That's right? correct. Sorry when you say means, to someone that you're sorry that they experienced a tragedy doesn't mean that you killed the person. That's correct. Exactly. Or, or, or I'm sorry that I uh, um, I forgot to pick you up. I'm sorry that I came late. I am sorry that I came late because you had to wait for me. And it was painful that you had to wait for me. But it's not my fault. So It may we, not be your fault. It, <laughs> correct. Correct. That's quite true. It may not be my fault. Sometimes it is. So then it's when you need to apologize when it is your fault. But it's important to learn that it doesn't have to be your fault to apologize, to, to, to say, say sorry. sorry. Sorry is just a way of acknowledging that the other person is seriously in pain. And I think some of us are so caught up in defensiveness that we are afraid to say, I'm sorry. If somebody says, oh man, you were so late. You were 20 minutes late. I had to stand here all by myself. And instead of going, Oh no, 20 minutes all by yourself, not sure. I am so sorry that I'm 20 minutes late. The person goes, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't, I couldn't help it that the train was late. So the poor person is standing there, had to stand in the rain. And I can't recognize any of that because all I want to do is defend the fact that it wasn't my fault. And really totally. what it boils down to there is, who are you thinking about? 
right? Exactly. Because they might both be true. But the question is, is the thing that comes to mind for me, well, it's not my fault, so don't be upset at me. Or is the thing that comes to That's mind, right may not be my fault, but I'm so sorry that this happened. Exactly. And I think that's exactly what it's about is learning that, yes, you may feel attacked. You may be being attacked. You may be, you may be being attacked at that moment, but try and get out of yourself for a while and try and put yourself in the other person's shoes for a moment and just be aware. Don't worry about whether it was or wasn't your fault and don't worry about yourself. Try to think for a moment leave me out of it, what is the other person experiencing? What is the other person thinking? What the other person is feeling? And usually, that's the best skill you can that learn. That sounds like that might really sort of be the thing that helps resolve or remove the negative aspects of a lot of these things, right? Because Absolutely. when we just put ourselves in the other person's shoes, think about them and their experience, that can then give us an appreciation for what they're going through without having to take away from our side of the picture. Yes, my experience is that this is for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, this is a skill people can learn. People who are injured, people who are insensitive, people who are insecure will often immediately feel a comment as a criticism about themselves. And I think What's important for them to learn is to not take it necessarily as a criticism, or even if it's meant as a criticism, to be able to step back and to be able to feel the other person's pain. Of course, I'm not talking about just criticism, but in a case where somebody is hurting. When somebody is hurting and they're sharing with you their hurt, and instead of wondering whether you are to being blamed for it or not, forget about that piece. Focus on the part of what that person has experienced and that has hurt them. And I've learned that that is actually a skill you can teach a lot of people. There are some people who you can't teach that to, unfortunately, and that's sad because how it affects a relationship. But in most relationships, with effort and with focus, people can actually learn that skill over time to stop putting themselves, their own fears, in the middle of every interaction. Okay, just to wrap things up with the marriage version of the question that we wrapped up with last time, I, I don't know if we can even ask this anymore. I feel like you might have already done this, but if you had to pick the number one most important or impactful or just your favorite piece of advice for people with regard to marriage, what would it be? If you own a fancy car, and you own a fancy computer, sometimes it doesn't act the way you want it to. You take it to a professional to get some advice. Going to a professional for advice or going to anybody for advice is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Anything which is sophisticated, anything which is worthwhile, it's worthwhile also, whether you have to pay or you have to be uncomfortable, Get, don't be afraid to get outside advice or outside help with your relationship because often there are solutions and help to a relationship and the fact that you don't know what they are or you don't find the way out of the, the problem by yourself doesn't mean there, aren't, there isn't help for your relationship. 